This is such a stereotype. Come on. Welcome to Scotland. <laughs> Lots of people follow this YouTube channel because of the vlogs I made during my PhD in atmospheric physics at the University of Exeter. Unfortunately, however, I had to graduate at some point, and that necessarily meant the end of my videos showing what doing a PhD was like. However, there are lots of people out there doing interesting PhD projects, and so in this video series, I'm spending a few days with a new researcher each episode, showing you what their life is like, learning a bit about them, and learning about the topic of their thesis. I'm here at the University of St Andrews to talk to Emma, a PhD student who's researching how exoplanets have been depicted in science fiction. There is, however, one small problem. Oh boy. So, be difficult. So, um, yeah, you got COVID, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On the morning that you arrived, I emailed you probably just after you had gotten off your sleeper train. Yep, that's exactly what happened. And uh, just this morning, I am finally free. I've been in isolation for 10 days because I just kept testing positive, but uh, feeling significantly better now. My voice was gone for a while. It's back now. Very, very unfortunate timing. I'm also up here giving some talks to the physics department, so it's not like I came all this way for nothing. Well, it's also not like I came here for nothing because this is a very pretty town. Here's how this video is going to work. Emma and I are going to be chatting over Zoom about her PhD, and you're going to be seeing some footage from me that I took in St Andrews whilst I was up there. And you're also going to see some footage from Emma in St Andrews, because she very kindly volunteered to vlog some of her time. And we'll all find out together if this video will actually work. For now, over to Emma to talk about what her thesis is roughly about. So I study exoplanets, which are planets outside our solar system, but I don't study the real ones. I study the fictional ones as they appear in science fiction because real exoplanets were discovered very recently, just in the 1990s, but people have been writing about planets outside our solar system for much, much longer. So I'm making a database of fictional exoplanets and seeing how the way writers have constructed them has changed uh, before and after the discovery of real exoplanets. I'm creating a database and I want it to be fairly representative, obviously, of before and after the discovery of real exoplanets, uh, but also of hard science fiction, which is more technically accurate, and soft science fiction, which is more space opera, could be magic, except they're not calling it that. So I started with a bunch of things that I was familiar with, and then I ended up making a Google form, um, so I'm crowdsourcing. It is uh, the pinned tweet on my Twitter, it's on my website, all sorts of things. You can submit um, any fictional exoplanet that you've heard of. When people study literature, usually they're doing close reading. You'll be looking at one book, often you can write an entire paper on just like one chapter of one book, and that's close reading. But that's not going to tell me anything about what what exoplanets are like across all of science fiction. So I am purposely abstracting my data. I'm purposely losing a lot of information about every planet in order to see a bigger picture and wider trends. So for each planet that goes in, I have these nine um, categories, nine variables that I answer about it. And they're almost all yes, no questions, except for the one that is the media type. Um, so the media type I have movies, books, TV shows, podcasts, and video games. So then the way I analyze all of this stuff is I use this software called Banjo, which is a Bayesian interference software to create Bayesian networks. So Bayesian networks are like all these little variables are bubbles, and then there's arrows connecting them that represent conditional dependencies between the variables. So a Bayesian network is sort of saying if we have more background information about a thing, we can make better predictions. So for example, if a planet is uh, not a gas giant, if it has humans, and those humans are non-native humans, whether it's more likely that that planet was written about before or after the discovery of real exoplanets. Planets. Yes. So the ver yeah, the variables will positively or negatively influence each other. So if one thing is true, it might be more it might make it more or less likely that another thing is true. So I'm most interested in this before after variable. And the things so far that I've found that are connected with that is I've found that before after um, negatively influences intelligent. So uh, after the discovery of real exoplanets, there's uh, I'm finding fewer portrayals of intelligent native life on exoplanets. I've got Scottish relatives who live on the Isle of Skye and I've visited Scotland absolutely tons of times and so I mean I just love it here. I, I think this is the, probably the best part of the UK to be completely honest with you. Like I like living in the West Country but 
It doesn't get much better than this. This is so beautiful. <laughs> also, if I tilt the camera over this way, if you're into golf, that's the old course over that way. Apparently that's a big thing for, I don't know, I don't know golf. One of the nice things about pandemic is that you're not expected to come into the office all the time. Um, so I think my preference is probably about three days in the office and two days not in a week. I wake up, go to wherever I end up working for the day. I'll usually check my email. It turns out grad school is like 50% email monitoring, <laughs> seeing if I have any meetings with anybody that day. It's Monday. And later this afternoon, I will be presenting my research at the Scottish Exoplanet and Brown Dwarf Spring Meeting 2022. Um, I've attended before, but this is my first time presenting my research. So I'm going to be spending this morning just adding finishing touches to my PowerPoint and uh, going through my talk once or twice to make sure I've got it down. And then I'll be heading over to the office later in the day. Presentation practiced. I am heading into the office and just gonna grab some lunch on the way. But I just wanna show off that this gorgeous alleyway is part of my commute and I'm still in awe about that. Lunch and coffee acquired. So here I am presenting a database of fictional exoplanets and a Bayesian network analysis of that database. Essentially, I'm defining it as stories that extrapolate from some element of science, they feature an estrangement or a major difference from our real world, and they're really fiction of what ifs. So I'm now back home after an afternoon of first presenting and then listening to a whole bunch of presentations about exoplanets and brown dwarfs. And I think my presentation went pretty well. I felt pretty good about it. I went first, which is always nice because then I can sit back and relax and enjoy the rest of the presentations afterwards. But I got some good questions and it was just so nice to do this in person. Uh, this is the first time that this particular meeting has run in person in two years. And it was lovely to get to meet a lot of people who had had been names in my email folder before this. But when I'm actually doing my research, um, I'll either be doing background reading or I'll be hunting for new planets. Occasionally just breaking down and emailing an author and usually they get back to me actually. Are there any interesting authors that you've had reply to? Charlie Strauss and he responded in two minutes and I was a little bit frightened. <laughs> I would be. <laughs> I'm also the uh, telescope trainer for undergrads who want to get trained on how to use the telescopes at our observatory. We have uh, the big one, the James Gregory telescope is used for research, but the other ones are pretty much just used to train undergrads who want to learn some observational astronomy, and then they can just come and do some recreational stargazing. In a way, St Andrews feels like a mix of both Oxford and Exeter, like the two universities I know very well, in that there's a lot of very lovely old buildings here. It's not a collegiate university, but the uni owns you know, houses and stuff scattered all throughout. Like I just passed the metaphysics department, like the divinity school's just over there, whereas the physics department's way over there. Like there is no one central campus, but it somehow feels like Exeter. I don't know if it's just because of the posh reputation. I'm very lucky, and it's actually very sunny today. Um, yeah, what a lovely place to go to uni. Look, snow cloud. And there's, I don't know how visible it is on camera, but there's just a light snow falling. What the heck, Scotland? I really should get better at filming these, but um, I, I did just do a talk. I didn't, I, I, I got, look, here's a clip of the audience. I did do a talk. I think it went well, don't you? Yeah, not bad. I've never liked just doing one subject. I describe myself somewhat jokingly as too interdisciplinary to function. When I was like 12, I really wanted to be a writer. That was what I was going to do. I didn't like science at all. Then at some point in middle school science, I decided I liked science and I went to a STEM focused high school and I found astronomy and I really liked astronomy. And then in undergrad, I went to Swarthmore College in the US, double majored in astronomy and history. I, I started thinking about grad school, but I was like, well, PhDs are meant to be deep dives into one subject. So how am I possibly going to ever do a PhD, even if I wanted to. And I applied to a whole bunch of just astronomy programs. I didn't get into any of them because I didn't have enough research. But one of my professors from undergrad forwarded me this strange scholarship from the University of St. Andrews. He was like, you're one of the only people who I think might be qualified for this because they were looking for either 
uh, somebody who studied literature but knew some computer science or a physicist who really liked to write or something like that because they wanted to do this uh, project of applying data science to science fiction. And it sounded really flexible and like I could sort of uh, make the project my own. Uh, so I applied and then I got in and I found out that I had got it a couple weeks before the pandemic started. Um, <laughs> so I, I got the acceptance email on like February 18th, 2020 or something like that. And then moved here without knowing anybody in this country. <laughs> and how does Scotland compare to the United States? Um, well, it's very different. It's much colder. It's a very obvious <laughs> surface level thing to say, but the people are really friendly. I can vote in the Scottish Council elections. I think that's really neat. I still haven't tried haggis. That's the first thing anybody asks me when I go to the US. What about iron brew? Yes, I have tried iron brew. I actually tried that in my first isolation. And I noticed all the restaurants had, had this thing called urn brew. And I'm like, what's urn brew? <laughs> so I Googled it quickly found out how it's actually pronounced um, and then ordered some. And uh, I actually filmed my first time tasting it. I could send that to you if you want, because oh, I do make do. a face. <laughs> yeah. What's it like to study in St. Andrews? Oh, it's really neat. It's um, perfect for me. I'm not a city person, so I don't like big cities. So it's, it's a fairly small town, but it's got probably like 10 different coffee shops and cafes, <laughs> which is all I need. It's right by the sea. I think there's just this kind of, when humans are near crashing waves, they just calm down a bit. So I can just go walk by the sea whenever I need to. You see that behind me? That's the beach where they filmed the famous running scene in Chariots of Fire. The one time I don't bring my running kit on one of these trips, <laughs> and it's probably the most famous running location in the entire country. <sighs> There's old stone ruins everywhere. The only thing it's really missing is a good forest. I can sort of pretend by walking uh, by the burn by Laid Brace. Uh, I downloaded some podcast called the Scottish History Podcast and just kind of walked around listening to it, going on long pandemic walks because I just realized I was standing a place where I didn't really know the history and that kind of unnerved me. So like, I need to learn. So I did. And it was great. Well, moving here and trying to integrate with a research group when um, everything is just video calls has been challenging, but <laughs> but I've done it. I mean, there's nothing else to do, but just do it when you're in a, a weird situation because of COVID. Like, I don't have a peer who's doing the same thing that I am. I just mostly, I'm administratively with a physics and astronomy school. I have um, an office, I have, or, well, a desk in an office in the physics and astronomy building. And so I mostly interact with them. She keeps a very tidy desk, doesn't she? One thing that I am able to do whilst in St Andrews, though, is join, well, I say join, derail a Twitch stream. Yeah. This is Thomas, you are the president of the School of Physics. Yes, um, right. For now, yes, uh, until the coup. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you invited me up here to give some talks, so we just yeah. actually had one on science communication, and we've got one this evening. But between them, we now have a live stream, uh, which we'll put the URL up on the screen and in the description, but you stream pretty regularly, and you're doing <laughs> what we're doing today a lot of the time, which is past papers, but specifically a Scottish past paper, right? Yeah, because they're a bit different. Are they harder? What's that before the X plus Y squared? I don't have a clue. Oh, great. Okay. I can't read it either. Hang on. That, it's not a partial derivative. Everything else I'm doing is like partial derivatives at the minute because Lagrangian dynamics. Wait, do you start your sixes at the top? Yeah, like a normal person. What? One, two, normal. three, okay. four. Weird. Six. <laughs> that's not a six, that's a gamma. That's a gamma. Completely different. <laughs> They're the same thing! I've said before that humanities students have to work so much harder to get funding for a PhD. And when they have it, they often have to be very creative with that funding. And Emma is no exception, because not only has she produced an anthology of short stories and poetry created by exoplanetary scientists working with artists, she's been working on her own original sci-fi concept, which is going to be premiering soon. So Rogue Maker is uh, my audio drama podcast. It began over a year ago as a live action role playing game that I played with my friends. Um, I wrote it as a LARP that we could do audio only over Discord again, because I, I was thinking about how much of my life exists in the audio. But the premise is that we're in the far future. We're on a commercial space flight. 
um, something goes wrong and the ship explodes and everybody ends up in these scattered escape pods um, that have all sorts of communication difficulties reaching each other. And somebody did blow up the ship and they have to figure out who did that, why that person did that, and where they're going now. But we're in the far future, as I said, there are humans, there are also aliens, and they come from a tidally locked planet, which was really fascinating from a world building perspective because I had to think about like their entire history as a species, how they evolved. So what you're doing is creating a whole new exoplanet, which is informed by all of this modern science, which can then form part of the database that you're constructing. Yeah, my, my plan that planet actually is in my database now. <laughs> I guess I sort of realized that I've always been studying things because I'm passionate about them in a fictional sense. Like I, I double majored in history and astronomy. My two favorite genres are historical fiction and science fiction. Um, so I, I just had this realization that I've been doing this for much longer. I'm just doing it officially now where I'm sort of studying something that is my passion. And it's a, a strange balancing act to like know when I'm working versus when I'm doing something for my hobby. But it is basically my second full-time job right now. I, I go home and I edit audio and um, our trailer is out now and our show is premiering on Star Wars Day on May the 4th. It's on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, all the normal ones. Um, we're on Twitter at RogueMakerPod. Um, and if you have a favorite podcast app that we are not on, you can just PM us and I will, I will see what I can do to get us on there. Awesome. So what's the plan now? Once you finish the PhD, what are you going to do next? Like I said, I'd I would really like to work in um, science communication, public outreach for a science organization or a museum or, or whoever. Um, I really like talking to people about exoplanets and I get really excited when I do it. So I think that would be a very fun job. In a perfect world, I would just be a science fiction author and I would make enough money off of that. But I don't think that's likely to happen. And I know that that's something that I will continue to do no matter what else I do, obviously, because I'm doing it currently with Rogue Maker. I also uh, could end up being a data scientist if I'm not able to find a job in science communication. Um, so I think I've, I've got options, um, even though it's a pretty out there PhD. That that's, that's what's next. Where that would end up being, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know if I want to stay in the UK or go to the US or... Earth, probably. I mean, Earth, probably. Yeah, no, the more I learn about exoplanets, the more I never want to go to one. <laughs> I hope this video has made you excited about the study of exoplanets, because with the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, scientists are about to discover thousands more, some of which will be unlike anything we've ever seen before. To understand the headlines that are about to come out, and learn more about how we discover exoplanets, check out the astronomy course on Brilliant, this video's sponsor. That course introduces you to worlds beyond Earth, the life cycles of stars, and cosmology. And like the rest of Brilliant, does so through interactive exercises, bite-sized chunks of information, and expertly written questions that emphasize learning by doing, and that mistakes are just learning opportunities. However, Brilliant is about much more than just astronomy. It's a tool available on desktop desktop and on mobile to support lifelong learning in science, computer science, and maths. That means it's ideal to supplement classroom learning for students, but also for adults who aren't done with learning about the world and want to do so in a meaningful way in their own time. I've used Brilliant for a while now across a wide range of subjects, and I've never been less than impressed. It has beautiful art, the exercises and courses are well thought through, and it works. I understand stuff now that I didn't before, and that's the best recommendation I can give. Head on over to brilliant.org slash Simon Clark to sign up, and the first 200 people to do so will get an amazing 20% discount of a premium annual subscription for themselves or a student in their lives. With thanks to Brilliant for their ongoing support of this channel. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you haven't already, check out the description because there's links to Emma's socials and also Rogue Maker, which will be premiering very soon. If you enjoyed this video, here's a playlist with all the other episodes in the series, and there's another recommendation for viewing just down there. Please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and if you enjoyed the video, please do pop it a like and tell people about it who you think may find it interesting. That just leaves me to say thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.